Hey guys, in this video I'm going to go over 14 of the most profound lines from the classic novel The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. This is a book that explores in amazing depth what it means to be an individual and live your life for your own values instead of just being a mirror of everybody else around you. So whether you've read the book or you haven't read the book, I picked quotes that were universal that you're going to understand and that are really going to affect you regardless of the context of the story. So I'm going to read off each of the quotes and I'm, and I'm going to talk about what it means and why it's still so relevant even now, 80 years after the book was written. Okay, here's the first line. It sounded as if the speaker were being very brave. It was a satisfying bravery. It never aroused antagonism. This one jumped out at me because I've seen it so much. There's so many people who will bravely stand up for whatever is the status quo, whatever is the mainstream orthodox belief, these people will defend because, of course, it's no risk to themselves. They talk like they're being brave, but really they're just aligning themselves with whatever side happens to be winning at the moment. You know, I've come across a lot of people that I like to call stalwart defenders of the status quo. These are people who crusade against anything that might be a little bit outside of the mainstream. They stand up for whatever the propaganda machine has put into their heads. They repeat it incessantly, and anybody who disagrees with it in the slightest way, they will beat to death over it. These are people who congratulate themselves for how reasonable they are because they don't believe in any kooky things. They believe exactly what they're told all the time, and they feel absolutely superior to anybody who's dumb or crazy enough to disagree with what they're told by the news, by the school system, by the government, by whoever happens to be in charge of the propaganda machines at the time. If you want to see the 100% perfect example of this kind of person, there's a website that exemplifies it exactly, and that website is called Rational Wiki. It's like a Wikipedia, but for people to push whatever is the mainstream belief and mock and disparage whatever beliefs happen to be a little bit outside the mainstream. So I actually use this website fairly often when I'm learning about some new belief, some new mindset that is outside of the mainstream orthodoxy and I want to see what the mainstream orthodoxy is, I go to Rational Wiki and read what they have to say about the new belief. So anyway, the people that are writing for Rational Wiki and the people like it who are constantly defending whatever the mainstream happens to be, that's exactly what Ayn Rand is talking about. It's a satisfying bravery because it never arouses antagonism. They swing their swords around and act like they're brave as long as there's nobody that's going to oppose them. Okay, second quote. To sell your soul is the easiest thing in the world. That's what everybody does every hour of his life. If I asked you to keep your soul, would you understand why that's much harder? This is exactly what I talked about in this video, how we are programmed in such a way that everything we do is for the sake of somebody else. And I don't mean to help somebody else, I mean for the sake of what somebody else thinks about us. So we go on vacation to a certain spot and all we're thinking about is what we're gonna post on Instagram that's gonna make people think that we're amazing and is gonna make people jealous of us. Or we go into business to try to prove our third grade teacher wrong when she said that we were gonna be a failure. Or we don't express our beliefs about something because we're afraid of being called a kook or being called crazy or being called a denier or some sort of ist or some sort of phobe. To sell your soul is easy. That's the default mode of society. But to keep your soul means to be true to yourself. And it's difficult because you have to risk going against the mainstream and you have to risk all of the possible ostracization, the losing friends that goes along with it. Okay, quote number three. It's what I couldn't understand about people for a long time. They have no self. They live within others. They live secondhand. Look at Peter Keating. He's paying the price and wondering for what sin and telling himself that he's been too selfish. In what act or thought of his has there ever been a self? What was his aim in life? Greatness in other people's eyes. Fame, admiration, envy, all that which comes from others. Others dictated his convictions, which he did not hold, but he was satisfied that others believed he held them. Others were his motive power and his prime concern. He didn't want to be great, but to be thought great. He didn't want to build, but to be admired as a builder. 
He borrowed from others in order to make an impression on others. There's your actual selflessness. It's his ego he's betrayed and given up. But everyone calls him selfish. That's the pattern of most people. Now, if you haven't read the book, this quote is about Peter Keating, who is the ideal example of somebody who lives completely for other people's impressions. And she says that he's paying the price. Well, Peter Keating becomes extremely successful for a long time because he bows to everybody else's opinion, gives everybody else exactly what they want to hear. But the whole time, he has this sense of unease, of cognitive dissonance, like there's something wrong, like there's something horrible that's going to happen. And eventually, it breaks him. His mind breaks down, and he suffers the consequences. He suffers the hell, if you will, of all his years of sinning against his own soul. He becomes an empty shell of a human being. He has no self-respect. He has no values. He has nothing to live for. And I believe that's exactly what happens to every person who lives for other people's impressions instead of for their own values. Okay, quote number four. Listen to what is being preached today. Look at everyone around us. You've wondered why they suffer, why they seek happiness and never find it. If any man stopped and asked himself whether he's ever held a truly personal desire, he'd find the answer. He'd see that all his wishes, his efforts, his dreams, his ambitions are motivated by other men. He's not really even struggling for material wealth, but for the second-hander's delusion, prestige, a stamp of approval, not his own. He can find no joy in the struggle and no joy when he has succeeded. He can't say about a single thing, this is what I wanted because I wanted it, not because it made my neighbors gape at me. Then he wonders why he's unhappy. I love this term that Ayn Rand came up with, second-handers, that people who live for other people's impressions are living second-hand, that Nothing is of their own creation. Everything is something that they got from somebody else. They're, that they're just living secondhand. Everything that they value, everything that they work for, is something that they receive from somebody else. They have no convictions of their own. They have no values of their own. All of their professed values, all of the things that they strive for, secondhand. They were given, they were inherited from somebody else instead of their own. And if you live for prestige, if you live for fame, if you live for all of the things that you want other people to think about you, then yes, you're going to be unhappy. And by the way, I've been very guilty of this for a large part of my life. And when I started learning how to cast it off and live for the things that are truly meaningful to me, to live for my own values instead of what other people think about me, I've been a lot happier as a result. Okay, quote number five. That, precisely, is the deadliness of second-handers. They have no concern for facts, ideas, work. They're concerned only with people. They don't ask, is this true? They ask, is this what others think is true? Not to judge, but to repeat. Not to do, but to give the impression of doing. Not creation, but show. Not ability, but friendship. Not merit, but pull. What would happen to the world without those who do, think, work, produce? Those are the egotists. You don't think through another's brain, and you don't work through another's hands. When you suspended your faculty of independent judgment, you suspend consciousness. To stop consciousness is to stop life. I believe that the people who really make the world better are the people who have their own values and their own convictions and their own guiding sense of what their purpose is in life. They, it's just such a much better, a much cleaner, much healthier motivation than trying to make yourself look better in the eyes of other people. And as I talked about before, the people who are hell-bent on controlling everybody else, they use this as a weapon. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But if you are able to think for yourself, you deny them the use of that weapon. And it's an interesting question. When you don't have any ideas of your own, you're just thinking through somebody else's impressions. When you don't do anything for yourself, you're just doing things for other people's impressions. Can you even really consider yourself alive? Can you even consider yourself an independent being? In a way, not really. Okay, quote number six. The Palmers bore you and the Eddingtons snub you, but you have to flatter people whom you despise in order to impress other people who despise you. Now this quote is Peter Keating's wife talking to him because he's obsessed with gaining the approval of how all the high society people around him, even though he doesn't even like those people and those people don't like him. He still lives his life to impress those people. It reminds me of a quote I talked about in this video. Uh, in Fight Club, where he says that 
We buy stuff we don't need to impress people we don't like. Is it any wonder that people who live their lives in that manner are completely depressed? Okay, quote number seven. People want nothing but mirrors around them, to reflect them while they're reflecting too. You know, like the senseless infinity you get from two mirrors facing each other across a narrow passage. Usually in the more vulgar kind of hotels, reflections of reflections and echoes of echoes. No beginning and no end. No center and no purpose. I love this analogy because it shows you why this kind of society is so attractive to the people who want to control everybody. If you think about a bunch of mirrors reflecting each other with no substance, but just reflecting the other mirrors, then whoever is the first mover, whoever does provide the substance in the form of propaganda, let's say, gets to be in all of the mirrors at the same time. So all of a sudden, if one person wants to control 10 million people, if those 10 million people are all empty mirrors, it's really easy to do. He just has to be the one person that offers something other than an empty mirror. All he has to do is feed his propaganda into the first mirror, and all the other mirrors will reflect it. Okay, quote number eight. It's said that the worst thing one can do to a man is to kill his self-respect. But that's not true. Self-respect is something that can't be killed. The worst thing is to kill a man's pretense at it. Now, my favorite part of this book is where the main character, who's like the hero of the story, he's the man who has his vision of the world, who has his values and does not sell them for anything. Well, he is completely unsuccessful in trying to be an architect, which is what his goal is. So he is forced to close down his architect office and go work as a regular laborer in a granite quarry. And I love this part of the book because even though he is working in a very low position, something that's completely beneath him. And even though he's barely making any money, even though he's been completely rejected by society, he still keeps every ounce of his self-respect. He still keeps completely true to what it is that he is trying to do. To him, it's just a temporary setback. It's not a failure. He knows he's going to get back up on his feet. And so he's perfectly happy to live in the granite quarry. And I love that image because I use it. It feeds me. In my own life, I think that if I am staying true to who I am, it doesn't matter how bad circumstances get. Nobody can take my self-respect away from me because I am doing what I know is the right thing. And I have absolute faith, I have absolute conviction that by doing the right thing, I am bringing about the best possible outcome. If you have true self-respect, that can't be killed. The people who are jumping out of buildings because they lost their job, it's not because they lost their self-respect, it's because they never had any in the first place, and now they've lost the illusion of self-respect. They've lost the illusion to the rest of society that they are valuable. So the best thing that you could possibly do for yourself is to kill the illusion of your self-respect voluntarily and do something noble that creates some real self-respect in its place. Okay, quote number nine. This is the, the bad guy of the story who's bent on controlling everybody. This is him explaining how to rule mankind. He says, there are many ways. Here's one, make men feel small, make him feel guilty, kill his aspiration and his integrity. How many times have you heard this? If you wanna create something, if you wanna build a business, let's say, you wanna be greater, you wanna do something bigger with your life than the life that's prescribed for you, that go to college, get a job, sit in a desk for your whole life until you're 65 and you have back problems. If you wanna do something better than that, what do they tell you? Oh, they tell you you're greedy, that you're selfish, that you have delusions of grandeur, right? They make you feel guilty for wanting to do anything great. And if you buy into it, then you are letting them kill your aspiration and your integrity. Okay, quote number 10. This is the same guy who's talking about another way to control mankind. He says, kill man's sense of values. Kill his capacity to recognize greatness or to achieve it. Great men can't be ruled. We don't want any great men. Don't deny the conception of greatness. Destroy it from within. The great is the rare, the difficult, the exceptional. Set up standards of achievement open to all, to the least, to the most inept. And you stop the impetus to effort in all men, great or small. You stop all incentive to improvement, to excellence, to perfection. And later he says, don't set out to raise all shrines, you'll frighten men enshrine mediocrity, and the shrines are raised. 
I love this quote because it explains so much of the world. Why is this idiotic modern art that's just paint splashed on a page with no beauty or no inspiration of any kind, why is this put in our most beautiful museums? Why is the most horrible music pushed onto us as if it's some work of genius? This is exactly why. People who want control over other human beings, they don't want greatness. They don't want genius. They don't want beauty. And so in order to destroy it, instead of burning the books like they used to, or instead of making it illegal, they just take the most pathetic, mediocre expressions of art, of literature, of entertainment, and they try to shove it down everybody's throats as though it's some work of genius. And if they can convince you to admire what is ugly and mundane, then chances are you won't ever aspire to anything other than creating things that are ugly and mundane. Okay, quote 11. The people had come to witness a sensational case, to see celebrities, to get material for conversation, to be seen, to kill time. They returned to unwanted jobs, unloved families, unchosen friends, to drawing rooms, evening clothes, cocktail glasses and movies, to unadmitted pain, murdered hope, desire left unreached, left hanging silently over a path on which no step was taken, to days of effort not to think, not to say, to forget and give in and give up. This, unfortunately, is exactly how in 2020 most people live their lives. They live their lives to kill time. Why? Because they don't enjoy their lives. They have no self-respect because they've sold their soul to other people. If you think about what it means to kill time, people do this all the time. They watch TV to kill time, or they play games to kill time. What are they really doing? Well, time is what life is made of. Time is the substance that creates your life. So to kill time is like a miniature suicide. To kill time is to demonstrate that you hate your own life. Quote number 12. And so, for the first time, they could see him as he was, a man totally innocent of fear. The fear of which they thought was not the normal kind, not a response to a tangible danger, but the chronic, unconfessed fear in which they all lived. They remembered the misery of the moments when, in loneliness, a man thinks of the bright words he could have said, but had not found and hates those who robbed him of his courage. The misery of knowing how strong and able one is in one's own mind, the radiant picture never to be made real. Dreams, self-delusion, or a murdered reality, unborn, killed by that corroding emotion without name. Fear, need, dependence, hatred. How many times have you stopped yourself from doing what your soul knew that you were supposed to be doing, from living your purpose in life, because of fear of what somebody else thought. Quote number 13. Throughout the centuries, there were men who took first steps down new roads, armed with nothing but their own vision. Their goals differed, but they all had this in common, that the step was first, the road was new, the vision unborrowed, and the response they received, hatred. The great creators, the thinkers, the artists, the scientists, the inventors, stood alone against the men of their time. Every great new thought was opposed. Every great new invention was denounced. The first motor was considered foolish. The airplane was considered impossible. The power loom was considered vicious. Anesthesia was considered sinful. But the men of unborrowed vision went ahead. They fought, they suffered, and they paid, but they won. No creator was prompted by a desire to serve his brothers, for his brothers rejected the gift he offered, and that gift destroyed the slothful routine of their lives. His truth was his only motive, his own truth, and his own work to achieve it in his own way. A symphony, a book, an engine, a philosophy, an airplane, or a building. That was his goal in his life. Not those who heard, read, operated, believed, flew, or inhabited the thing he had created. The creation, not its users. The creation, not the benefits others derived from it. The creation which gave form to his truth. He held his truth above all things and against all men. His vision, his strength, his courage came from his own spirit. If you want to be great, many times you don't do it for other people. You do it in spite of other people because other people will hate you for it. And if you try to be great, they will hate you for trying and they will make fun of you because you're not succeeding at first. Of course you're not going to succeed at first. You need time to grow. You need time to get experience. You need to learn in order to get to the point where you can succeed. But they will mock you every step of the way because you're trying for something while they're settling. 
So if you're trying to do anything great in life, you have to have your own vision, your own values that drive you. You can't be doing it to impress other people. It just won't work. Okay, and quote number 14. Who permitted them to do it? No particular man among the dozens in authority. No one cared to permit it or to stop it. No one was responsible. No one can be held to account. Such is the nature of all collective action. This is exactly how it works. If you've ever dealt with a government and they've been completely incompetent or they've failed you or they've done something horrible to you, nobody's held accountable, right? You, the only accountability that they have is that you can go vote for a guy and have one out of a hundred million chance of deciding the election and then if your guy wins, maybe he can replace the guy in charge of the department that wronged you and then maybe that guy can replace the undersecretary of that department and then maybe that guy can replace the regional manager of that department and maybe that guy can replace the city manager of that department and maybe that guy can replace the middle manager under him and maybe that guy can fire the guy who wronged you. How likely is that? Very, very, very unlikely. So the lesson here, which is a little tangential to the rest of the book, is be very careful before you ask the government to take over some important part of your life because they have zero accountability. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, hit the little bell icon beside the subscribe button, share this video with anybody who needs to hear it, and I think you'll also really enjoy this video I did recently all about how you can find your own values and how you can stay true to yourself and why you might want to do it. And as always, let me know what you think in the comments.